Thanksgiving Day celebration. Um, just a little bit of background. Basically, uh, the, the former senator, the late senator, I should say, uh, Robert Byrd of West Virginia, sponsored legislation that requires any any institution, any college that gets federal money of any sort, including the federal work study uh, grants, um, is required to basically put on events celebrating the Constitution. And so for the last several years now, for quite a while now, Providence College has been putting on these events. Um, tonight we have uh, four, uh, basically, four participants, or I was going to say mock lawyers, but we actually have a real lawyer here. First of all, we have <laughs> Professor Rick Battistoni of the Political Science Department, uh, Professor Mark Hyde, uh, Pat McLaughlin, and Professor Bill Hudson. Um, we also have a panel of student judges who will be uh, adjudicating their arguments uh, after they uh, put forth their, their arguments. Could you introduce yourself? Matt McCabe. Matt McCabe? Caitlin Ruchel. Angela Bertha. Sarah Matt Lavanera. Lauren Baldock. So anyway, um, I will hand it over to you guys to begin. But, oh, one more thing, sorry. Those of you who are required to sign in, uh, maybe your professors required you to come, I know there's some 101 students from uh, Professor Ben Arts' class and also uh, Professor Battistoni's class. Their sign-in sheet's down there. If you can wait till the end of the evening or end of the debate before you sign in over there and also help yourselves. Okay, let me give you a quick idea of what the format is for, for this evening. Uh, we thought we ought to begin this discussion with a little primer on what is in the health uh, care legislation in the past by Congress. Because I, our, our assumption is a lot of you might be pretty hazy as to what actually is in this legislation. So we're going to do a, a quick primer on that. Then uh, we're going to actually get into the actual constitutional arguments. Uh, as usually is the case in the courtrooms, the plaintiff goes first. The Healthcare Act is not constitutional. We'll make that act. And that was Professor Mattistoni, Professor Hyde, and everything that side. And then the defense will defend the constitutional act, constitutionality of the act. And that will be uh, uh, Elizabeth Laughlin and myself. Uh, Professor Mattistoni is going to present briefly the plaintiff's case. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, in our case, uh, the real lawyer is going to present the defense. Uh, then we're going to take a few minutes to have a dialogue with the judges, to give the judges an opportunity, as usually happens, say, in the Supreme Court, where the judges question the lawyers about their arguments. So the judges will be able to do that, and there'll be a little interaction among ourselves about the constitutionality of the issue. Uh, at that point, uh, the judges will leave the room and deliberate, uh, and then come back with a learned opinion as to whether or not uh, they think uh, the Health Care Act is constitutional. And then we'll open it up to kind of a general discussion about the issues, okay? So that's the way things are going to go in probably about an hour and a half or so. Okay, let me start with a very quick primer on what is in the health care legislation. Which is crucial if you're going to understand how the constitutional argument. Uh, I'm going to start by describing the existing health care system. Okay? This is the existing system before the Health Care Act has been uh, implemented. Uh, the first point that you need to think about is that the health care system is a big part of the economy. 17% of GDP. Okay? So this is a very important economic <coughs> issue, uh, is health care uh, How do Americans get their health insurance now? About 14% get their health insurance from Medicare, America's universal health care program for the elderly, people over age 65. Another 13% get, get the, their insurance through Medicaid. This is a program for low-income people. 58% get private health insurance. Most of us get our health insurance through employer-based group plans. This means our employer offers health insurance as an employment benefit. Uh, the employer-based plans are organized the way all insurance really has to be. You take a big group of people, all the employees of say Providence College, you charge a premium for each one of those individuals, paid to the insurance company. Okay, so each individual 
is a source of revenue in the form of premiums to the insurance company. And if you have a large group of people, the insurance company can raise enough money to pay the cost of the small proportion of that large group that will be expensive, that will need help, will need help. Okay, that's insurance plans. You spread the risk among a big group to cover a problem that any of us might have, but in any particular point in time, only a minority will have. So a relatively low premium from a lot of people will come up with enough money to pay the costs of people who need a bit of who get sick and have and have and hospital bills and doctors have to be paid. Okay? So employer-based group plans is the major way that most people under age 65 get health insurance in the United States. And then there are individuals who don't have employer-based plans who have to go in the insurance market and buy individual insurance. In this case, there's no group. Okay, in this case, insurance companies sell individuals insurance based upon the insurance company's guess as to whether or not this person is going to get sick. Okay? And if insurance companies think a person is going to get sick, they're not going to sell insurance. Okay? Uh, in the individual market, there's a problem with uh, this uh, pre-existing condition problem. The insurance companies can't make money if they have to sell insurance to people who they know have cancer. So they're simply going to refuse them. So under the existing system, individuals have a difficult time sometimes by getting insurance. And then finally, there's in, in uninsured, about 15% of the population, uh, 45 million people. These statistics are from before the recession started. Uh, as of this last week, the Census Bureau says there are now 50 million uninsured people in the United States. Okay, who pays the cost of health care? Uh, government pays 45%. Okay, government is the biggest health health care uh, financier in the country. The insurance industry 35%, and then individuals pay 15% out of pocket. Who provides health care? In the United States, health care is provided by independent providers, doctors, hospitals, who basically work for themselves and sell their services on the open market. Some of these, some of these providers do it to earn a profit. They're for-profit providers. Some of them are non-profit providers. Whether they're profit or non-profit, they're selling their services to those people who need them. And then government also provides some services for the military, for veterans, hospitals, community health clinics, and just other government institutions. What will the Health Care Protection and Affordability Act do? Uh, first, and most important to keep in mind, is that it leaves most of the existing health care system in place. Okay? Private insurance, the employer-based system for most Americans will, will stay in place. Providence College will still provide my health insurance. Medicare and Medicaid will continue, pretty much as they're organized right now. And providers will continue to sell their services. Okay, I'll still go to Dr. Troisi every year for my annual checkup, in much the same way that I've done for years now. Second, the Act creates mechanisms to provide insurance for the current uninsured. This is the main goal of legislation, to provide insurance co coverage to that 15% or so of the population that doesn't now have insurance. And then also, as a part of this, there's increased federal government regulation of the private health insurance industry. Uh, there are some, there's some things in the Act that, that require certain benefit, minimum benefits uh, that need to be provided in insurance contracts. Uh, the legislation denies, uh, prevents insurance companies from denying people coverage for pre-existing conditions. This is a very important element of the legislation so that now people with cancer can't be denied insurance because they have that condition. Okay. Um, children can be covered under parents' plans up to age 26, something that might be relevant to all of you in this room. Yeah, and then there's other, lots of other regulations. It's quite complicated, so but these are the three big ones that you need to keep in mind. How will the currently uninsured be covered? Okay, how are we gonna cover these uninsured people? 
first thing the legislation does is it increases the number of people who are eligible for Medicaid. And that's that program number for people with low incomes. Right now, most of the people in that program have are, are at the poverty line or lower, okay? 100% of the poverty line, that's most of the people in the program. Uh, the legislation allows people who are a little wealth, who have a little higher incomes, up to 133% of the poverty level now nationwide to get Medicaid, okay? Businesses will also be uh, essentially required, many of businesses who don't now provide employee health insurance will be required to provide that insurance uh, if they're businesses with more than 50 employees. Um, and there's a number of tax incentives and penalties to get them to do that, okay? Third, and this is what's probably got the most publicity, uh, health insurance is going to be made on a, available on a state-by-state -state basis in special exchanges, they're called, they're essentially marketplaces, where insurance companies, lots of insurance companies, will come in and offer their health insurance to a large pool of people in the state, those individuals without health insurance, and also a number of small businesses uh, that currently can't afford to buy health insurance for their employees will also be able to buy health insurance in these exchanges. What these exchanges do is create a large pool of people. Remember I talked about that, that's the way insurance works? You need a large pool of people with each individual paying a premium uh, to cover the cost of the small proportion of that pool that will need uh, medical care in any given year, okay? And so that's what the exchange does. It creates a pool in the state. Those people are all part of the pool. They all pay premiums to whichever insurance company they are buying their insurance from. And then the people, cover people get their health care insurance uh, The exchange is supposed to produce competition between different health insurers uh, offering different kinds of health benefits within the regulations provided in the legislation. And so to help out those people who are having to buy this health insurance from these changes, there are lots of subsidies uh, and tax incentives given to people uh, to help them pay the cost of their health insurance. And finally, and this is what we're going to be debating, there is a mandate in this legislation for all individuals to have insurance. Uh, and subsidies for low-income individuals, uh, there is a tax penalty that will be assessed on those individuals who don't purchase insurance, okay? Uh, no more, it's $695 per year, so if you, if you don't buy insurance, you will have to pay this tax. Although there's a cap on the amount, nobody is gonna pay a tax over 30 years higher than $2,085. And there are some exemptions for people who have religious objections. If you're a Christian scientist and you don't believe in healthcare, you don't have to buy insurance. Uh, if you have a special financial hardship that just prohibits you from affording the coverage, you also can be exempt, etc. Okay, why the individual mandate? Why does this legislation require every individual to buy health insurance? Okay, the first reason is for what I've been talking about. Uh, you're only going to be able to get insurance to work if you have a large pool of people paying health insurance, including healthy people who are paying premiums who might get sick, but likely won't, but will support with their finances the costs of those people who do get sick. That's how insurance works. Secondly, uh, the mandate prevents individuals from being what economists call free riders. People who don't get health insurance, and then when they get sick, show up at the emergency room and get health care, Healthcare, which is going to be subsidized by those people who are paying health insurance. Okay? That's who pays for that emergency room care. Uh, and so they'll act as prevent people from being able to do that. Essentially, get a free ride. Get their health care when they're sick, but not have to pay anything for it. And thirdly, the uh, mandate is supposed to prevent what's called adverse selection. That, that is uh, people waiting until they're sick. Remember, the legislation doesn't allow insurance companies 
to not sell people insurance because of pre-existing conditions. That's a change. So that this mandate prevents people from taking advantage of that and waiting to buy their insurance when they get sick. Okay, so you don't buy insurance, but then when the doctor tells you you've got cancer, you need chemotherapy, then you go and say, okay, give me insurance, I'll pay my premium now. Okay? Uh, the system will not work if that can't be in place. Insurance companies cannot afford to give insurance if they're only going to, to get premiums for people who are sick. They have to have <coughs> premium therapy or Okay. All right. It's probably 15 minutes rather than 10 minutes. I'll change the first slide. The question, is this individual mandate, which I've justified in policy terms, okay? So even if you think you understand the policy logic, the question is, is the individual mandate also constitutional? And that's what we're going to do. Thank you, and uh, may it please the court. Uh, no, it is not. Uh, the Health Care Protection and Affordable Care Act is not only not constitutional, it's unprecedented, both in its expansion of the powers of the federal government and what it requires of individual citizens. The federal government has never required people to buy any good or service as a condition of lawful residence in the United States. Now, there are a number of constitutional issues presented by this piece of legislation. It's very complex, as Professor Hudson indicated. There are a lot of different constitutional issues. We are going to focus our attention on the part that mandates that individuals buy private health insurance or face a penalty. We believe that this clearly oversteps the federal government's authority under the Constitution. Now, the lawyers for the government uh, will have you believe that the authority for such a grand assumption of federal power comes from the Commerce Clause, that provision in the Constitution that states that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce among the several states. And indeed, the Supreme Court has been quite generous uh, in its interpretation of the Commerce Clause, allowing, for example, the federal government to regulate and restrict um, a farmer's growing of wheat for purely home consumption purposes or for home consumption. Since, they argued, this affected the total amount of wheat in commerce and therefore the price of wheat overall. Uh, more recently, the, the Supreme Court allowed the federal government to override uh, and overcome state laws that make it legal for people privately growing marijuana for personal medical purposes so that they could prosecute them, even though the states had passed laws that allowed them to be exempt. But, uh, as you know, the federal courts in recent years have also declared unconstitutional efforts by Congress to use the commerce power to restrict activity that is not explicitly economic in nature, and, and we can't emphasize this enough, the court has never allowed the federal government to use the commerce power to force individuals to engage in economic activity. That is to punish the choice by an individual of economic non-activity that they won't uh, buy, in this case, health insurance. This law certainly does that, and this is what we think oversteps the federal government's power. The government's lawyers may uh, have this fallback that the necessary and proper clause of the Constitution also gives the, uh, Congress the authority to pass this law. But we would argue that the Necessary and Proper Clause does not add to the government's powers. It only allows the government to achieve its limited powers, its limited ends, uh, through constitutional means uh, that are deemed necessary and proper. That is, appropriate and plainly adapted to the constitutional end in question. The fact that this mandate that people purchase health insurance exceeds any of the powers that Congress does have under the Constitution and uh, that, it, that there are all kinds of other less intrusive and less oppressive uh, ways of regulating health care as a, as a part of the national economy um, renders, I think, the necessary and proper clause impotent in this case. To allow the federal government this degree of authority either under the uh, Commerce Clause or the necessary and proper clause would obliterate the boundary between federal and state authority under the Constitution. 
and we are quite concerned about this. This precedent set that would be set if you were to approve this mandate uh, is a precedent for a very broad assumption of federal authority over our citizens. In fact, we would argue that if you rule this law constitutional, there would be virtually no limit to the federal government's power over individuals' economic lives. In the future, Congress could require individuals to purchase treasury bonds, um, to mandate that property owners purchase solar panels for their homes, or that each individual purchasing a car buy an electric car from General Motors, uh, uh, which uh, is owned in part by the government, right? Or even a certain amount of consumer goods per month uh, uh, or pay a tax penalty, because not doing so would, of course, affect uh, commerce and the national economy negatively. The Constitution is a document that protects the individual liberty of its citizens. It does so first by limiting the powers that the federal government has, uh, and secondly, by giving those powers, reserving those powers not delegated to the federal government, to the states, um, on the principle that any restrictions the people should be, uh, on the people should be consented to on the local level where power is visible and, and more accountable. So for example, we, we all agree that the states have what we call police powers, powers to regulate the safety, health, welfare, and morals of their people. But the argument is that those kinds of restrictions that might come are ones that are closer to home, uh, where power again is visible and more accountable. We believe this law clearly violates the Founder's vision, both of the proper balance between the federal and the state governments, and between the government and individual freedom of choice. I think Professor Hyde is going to close out here with a few more points. Yes, I'm not going to take the court's time too much of just two brief points that I would like to make because I would like the court to remember what the issues are. First of all, I'd like to remind you that the issue that we're considering tonight is not the number of individuals in the United States who have health insurance. It's not about expanding affordable health care to as many people as possible, however laudable that goal might be. It's not about how effectively this particular Act, the Health Care Protection and Affordable Act, Care Act, might achieve this policy objective. The only question before us tonight is whether this act can pass constitutional muster. And as pointed out by Professor Baxter, it cannot. I would like to reiterate one point that he made. I think it's the key, and I think the court ought to pay attention to this. This act by the Congress compels individuals citizens of the United States to initiate an economic act by requiring them to purchase health insurance to the face of health. That's an unprecedented individual mandate. It's clearly beyond the scope of the Commerce Clause that allows only the regulation.
Dr. Hudson provided, you can see this is an issue of national, that means a national solution. This issue of interstate, whether this is a state issue or a federal issue. When the Constitution, the value of the Constitution, is written broadly enough that we can still use it today as a viable working document, but it's broad enough to be able to guide us in a way that stays relevant to today's world. Can anything in today's world be interesting? If you think of the internet, you think of the healthcare system, is there anywhere where you can just purchase healthcare inside one state? Does healthcare deal with equipment manufacturers from one state? It's no longer viable in today's society that anything is realistically interesting, so this is clearly an interstate issue. Uh, whether the question of whether we over it oversteps its power, I would argue in a few moments when we outline our case, absolutely not. If this isn't an example of interstate commerce, an example of national significance that we need to address, then I don't think there's one that um, that we can see that's, good, that's on more point within what this issue does. It's not that the, the kind of Congress has been generous. It's been accurate. It's been accurate at looking at what its power has been afforded under the Constitution and applying that. Many of the examples that were used uh, by our brothers on this argument were all examples that were not economic. Marijuana use, gender-based, racial based You see a lot of these cases over the years. But if you read those cases carefully, each and every one of them talk about the fact that we're dealing with a non-economic issue. This is different. This is dealing with economic. And if you look at the other set of cases that is parallel to that, you will see that when it does get into the economic area, the interstate commerce clause is quite clear. <coughs> so, you know, while we say Congress is stepping forward and has been presented uh, by the defense, the individual mandate is constitutional. The question is, no one's being forced here to purchase insurance. There's a choice. You can purchase insurance or you can pay the tax. So it's not as our individual freedoms, and that's another thing that was brought up, and it's true, the uh, Constitution would protect, this is through a taxing authority, and I'm gonna talk in a moment about what that taxing authority allows Congress to do. That is the option. You can be taxed, you do not have to purchase this idea of inactivity. Um, can they regulate someone to do something they may not otherwise have done? In many of the examples of courts, when you see the courts deal with inactivity, those are things you can choose or not choose to do. Car insurance, you can choose not to drive. There's a lot of these things that the courts does that, that you can choose. The inherent nature of healthcare is you can't choose. Unfortunately, at some day, we are all gonna face a situation that we are gonna have to deal with healthcare. We are gonna have to deal with the health system. And right now, what is broken about the system is that we are not able to have a system that is equitable because you do have, as Dr. Hudson laid out at the beginning, the free rider situation. People wait it out. Enter the market when they need the activity. So it's clear under the necessary and proper clause that Congress is able to deal with the to deal with interstate commerce. We have 30, 40 years of precedent on that. And they are able to do anything that is rational behavior to achieve those ends. And I think if you look at the facts that are presented today, they do have that. And while a lot of the discussions that have gone on in the media and have gone on a bit in the uh, arguments that have already started here today is whether or not Congress should pass this. This is not what is in debate today in the court. What is in debate is can Congress do this? Can they pass this law? Not should. The legislative branch who is given the authority to create statutory law already has that debate. The debate now is did they do a square in the Constitution? We would argue that is absolutely been the case. They can do this by the vehicle how which they have put in place. They have made some key findings here that have shown that they have done the proper deliberation that in fact this is a national issue. This is an issue that if you leave it to the states, there would be too many complexities to address the problem effectively. And if you're not gonna address the problem effectively, then you're not gonna deal with the national issue that was laid out earlier in the presentation. So it does come down with this idea of individual <coughs> mandate. And you can see why the media get confused about this because it can get portrayed as in fact that this is being mandated or required. And oftentimes you don't hear about the clear other choice of just accepting the tax. If you choose not to participate, you can do that. The other thing that came up in the conversation earlier was the idea about individual liberties and individual freedoms. Actually what the Constitution protects is fundamental rights. And there, that is absolutely true. No matter what vehicle of taxation is used, if it in fact violated a fundamental right, then you could not do it. However, healthcare is not a fundamental right. It's never been, it's never been interpreted to be so. Also, having the exceptions under the law that, that, that Congress thought through 
very Catholic, the religious exemption of financial hardship protected against any of those potential fundamental rights being put in jeopardy. So I think it's clear, I think we've argued, you know, back and forth, I think it's been both sides is pretty well say that this is an interstate commerce issue. This is a national issue. If you look at some of the numbers that go on in the United States right now, I think some of which that uh, Dr. Hudson did, 2.5 trillion a year on health care in the year 2009. Uncompensated care in 2008 is $43 billion. 62% of all personal bankruptcies in this country are due to health care. This is a national crisis. This is something Congress does need to do. And we would argue that it can do that in the vehicle upon which it's been done through the necessary and proper laws. If it is something that has a rational basis, if this has a rational basis, if it's something that they can address under their express powers, this interstate commerce is something they can address under their express powers, then Congress has the power to employ any means that can be reasonably adopted in order to achieve that. And when they legislate in furtherance of that legitimate end, then I would argue, under the separation of powers, that the court should not step in. The court should not step in with the broad deference to the deliberations that have been done by the legislative branch. The Constitution has given Congress the authority to enact a regulation around interstate commerce. It possesses every power necessary, clearly, in the Constitution needed to make that, those means, those ends, and those regulations. I'm going to clean up for our side what Professor Hyde cleaned up for his and make just two quick points. First, I want to address the, the hysterical claim that Professor Babstoni made about <laughs> the fact that this is an unprecedented mandate to require, to require individuals to engage in economic activity, something the federal government has never, never done before. Uh, false. The federal government uh, issues requirements that require individuals to engage in economic activity all the time. And those, uh, those pieces of legislation have been held, upheld by the Supreme Court repeatedly. For example, in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Congress said that uh, a hotel owner could not uh, engage in the economic choice of denying a hotel room to an African American. And that that couldn't happen, okay? And the court said, of course, that's certainly possible under the Congress law, a uh, Congress uh, clause, uh, to do that. Uh, governments all over established toll roads that require people to pay tolls in order to drive <coughs> on the road or the bridge, okay? Uh, not long ago, in probably your memory, the Congress enacted a. Uh, legislation regulating the uh, television spectrum that said only HDTVs uh, would be able to be used. And so all of us, like me, had to go out and buy a special converter box for my old-fashioned analog TV so I could receive HDTV uh, 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 broadcast. Okay, so this notion that you know there's something really strange or weird going on here, uh, maybe a little different from some of these things, but the, the general principle that the federal government can uh, induce individuals to engage in economic activity is certainly uh, not true. Not true. Uh, Professor Battistoni lists a, uh, he, he, he uh, makes a list of these horribles that are going to happen if this goes through. Uh, the government is going to require people to put, put solar panels in their houses. And I think that all the other ones that all the things that they're going to do. Uh, that's a, old-fashioned lawyer trick, you know, list of worst possible things that might happen. And that's not going to happen, okay? In order for these things to pass constitutional muster, the Supreme Court has said over and over again that the Congress has to provide a rational basis. That means a reasonable argument in the legislation as to why this is necessary for the legislation to work in the interest of the common good. And this individual mandate, if you want to call it that, uh, precisely is justified in the legislation. So, as explained, the whole structure of the method devised here to cover the uninsured will collapse if, in fact, individuals are allowed to free ride and simply get medical care without making their own contribution. So it do this does meet the rational basis test. I don't think requiring solar panels necessarily would. Second point, 
although we call this a, a, a mandate, and it could be seen in, that, in those terms, if you really look at what's going on here, as uh, Ms. McLaughlin pointed out, the legislation actually doesn't mandate anything. It doesn't force people to buy health insurance. What it does is to say, don't buy health insurance, you're going to pay a tax. There is a tax created on those people who don't buy health insurance. Sure, the tax is there to try to get them to buy health insurance, but there's nothing new or unusual about that. The Congress for years, and the Supreme Court has affirmed this as perfectly constitutional time again, constantly passes tax laws to induce people to behave in certain ways. Uh, the federal government provides a deduction, a tax deduction, a reduction in taxes for those people who, who take out a mortgage to purchase a home. Looked at another way, what they've done is essentially opposed, imposed in that law a tax on people who choose to rent instead of buy a home. Why? Because the Congress had, wants to encourage people to buy homes rather than rent their housing. Okay? Uh, tax on renters. Child care tax credit. The Congress wants to encourage people to have children and support them. Encourage family values. Okay? So it gives people a tax credit if they have children. That's a tax on those of us who don't have children. Okay? So that's what's happening here. Uh, they're simply taxing individuals who choose not to buy health insurance. Okay? Individuals can choose to pay the tax or they can choose to buy the health insurance. It's up to them. Okay? No criminal penalties. Okay? Nobody's going to go to jail if they don't buy health insurance. Okay? Uh, a lot of people are exempt. The only thing that's going to happen is that people are going to pay a tax if they choose not to buy them. I think from every point of view, this legislation is consistent with 50 years of jurisprudence and Supreme Court decisions, and the Supreme Court certainly, and, and the judges certainly ought to uh, endorse this as constitutional.
choice is a little different, okay? But I can choose, uh, if I simply don't want to buy health insurance, to pay this month and not as tax, and get an option health insurance. I'll go to the top of house that choose not to do, but we wouldn't be taxed if you made that decision. Um, I mean, I, I would argue that, again, in fact, there was some tax analogy that all the time uh, we are induced to aid in certain ways uh, in order to avoid taxes. Okay. Are the power taxation I'm sorry, it's very clear as is, is a power, express power of the, of the Congress, when in fact it ties back to express power. And that is really where the interstate power is. So I think that if you're clear on the belief that this is really a national issue that has interstate commerce ramifications, therefore that that's the express power, they then under the have the necessary and proper means to do that, if they have a rational basis for doing that, why do you see so many findings in the law in order to establish that rational basis? That goes back to that question of let Congress debate what should be the case and have the courts look at what can happen if we have the law. Well, what, what Congress did do was, in, in the question of penalty versus tax, I mean, they did have other options in terms of deciding how they wanted to guarantee health care to more people. And one of the ways they could have done it, I'm not arguing they should have done it, one of the ways they could have done it is simply with directly taxing everyone and providing a single payer system in which everybody would pay and everybody would participate. But they chose not to do this and they chose to do something else. I would argue that by not doing that, they, but by choosing not to tax everyone, that what you would call a tax, I would call a penalty. That it is not a tax, it's a penalty trying to force those who will not participate into doing so. And the primary intent of taxes is to raise funds. Now, I don't think there's any intent to raise funds whatsoever. I think it's to punish people. Yeah, and I would say that if the tax successfully got people to purchase health insurance, it would raise zero funds. And so, and, and we, we were prepared to talk about the taxing power, but we really believe that whether or not this tax is constitutional hinges on whether the mandate is constitutional. So uh, I think it may, I think it is a penalty, but um, but I think it really hinges on this whole question. However, I think there's one more fundamental question before I get into that. I think that the issue of whether it's a tax or a penalty, it is clear that Congress has the ability to tax. The question comes into play, and the courts have examined this when it deals with fundamental right. And there is no fundamental right. Right. In fact, if there was, you'd have a much stronger case for the federal government, actually. And in fact, no, and in fact... And I wouldn't, you know, I'm not arguing whether whether a human right to health care ought to be included in the Constitution. We have an antiquated Constitution. It hasn't kept pace with the 20th and 21st century. Most <coughs> developed countries have a right to health care enshrined in their Constitution. If that were the case, then the government, as in order to provide that fundamental right, would have the power to provide health care to everyone. But our Constitution doesn't give a fundamental right to health care. And we're not arguing that the fundamental right to health care prohibits the government. We think we'd be on very shaky ground if there was a fundamental right to health care. Professor Battistone, you're in cloud cuckoo land. <laughs> you're talking about, well, we need a different constitution. No, I'm saying if we, we had a different we one, should have had argument would universal be universal health care. The well, fact is the Congress, when faced with this very important policy issue, how do we uh, provide health insurance to those uh, 50 million Americans who don't have insurance, had to prudently think through how that could be best done within the United States of America under our present Constitution, not the one you would like to write, but our present Constitution, uh, it, given the circumstances of today. Which they and they, do. And yeah. they reasonably and rationally considered alternatives opted not to impose universal health insurance law, but opted instead to use the existing private health insurance system in order to address this problem for the uh, public welfare. And they worked out a system that, in order to work properly, 
um, means that individuals uh, need to be encouraged to have health insurance. And they created a tax, as the, as the Congress has done repeatedly, and taxes are, the Supreme Court has made clear the, ta the purpose of taxation need not necessarily be sold or raised revenue. Exactly. But in fact, the tax system is legitimate to use tax system to, to, to achieve social purposes that have a rational basis, and that's exactly what they did. They created a tax. You're to, wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason you are is because your argument that court case was that this is a political product of a political system within the framework of the Constitution. But it isn't rational, it's irrational. It's irrational, the result is irrational, in one sense that we've already argued, that they're using the tax power, or claiming to use the tax power, you are, for penalty, but it's not the intent of that. And secondly, as Professor Rockland was arguing, she argues that this really is, falls under the interstate commerce clause. And given what the courts have decided, it's pretty difficult to, to, to argue that it doesn't fall under the interstate commerce clause. But why then would the Congress irrationally set up health exchanges in individual states and restrict <coughs> purchasing by individuals only within their own state if this is an interstate commerce issue. This, that, the reason is because it's an irrational response to the political situation, not rational response. What's happened is the political situation has forced politicians to develop a policy which is irrational and violates fundamental parts of the American Constitution. But the Constitution allows Congress to further the legitimate end upon which they have expressed power. And they do, in fact, have expressed power of interstate commerce. They have used a rational activity and a reasonable means <coughs> to deal with a national issue. And when that has been the case, we have some case precedent for 100 years to demonstrate that the courts will give the deference to the courts who have the overarching uh, responsibility to create statutory This may so not be a national issue. Why, why does the act? limit people buying their insurance within their own state. The implicit argument there is that this is a state issue. And in fact, states could do that, and states have set up this kind of system. Well, actually, the state has the exact choice that the individual has. The state can also opt out of this under the way in which it's been crafted yes. and not accept uh, Medicare payments. So they have the same yes. choice. So, but, that's, but that's another false choice because Medicaid, Medicaid budgets are such a high proportion of Budget. I mean, they're, they're the most expensive, uh, uh, the biggest expense that states have. And consequently, to say you can opt out of this and you want to make the federal money, that's not a good That budget. is a should discussion, that is not a can discussion. The can discussion is, is that they do have the individual choice at the state level as well as the individual. Well, and I think it's the same thing as the, the, the robber who comes up and says, your money or your life. You yeah. have a choice. In the case of highway bonds, it's the same thing. You can't opt out of it, and that was constitutional. In terms of, but that's that's but that's state, but that's that that's a state issue. We're talking about individuals. We're not talking about states being mandated in this law. We're talking about individuals being mandated. With little deference to my brothers, they seem to go back and forth between the individual and the state, and the argument prevails. <laughs> no, and, and, and we're gonna and we're gonna argue that uh, we would argue that the states have the power to uh, mandate that people purchase health insurance. That's that clearly choice, within the police powers. That's cl but clearly they can mandate that people have uh, if they people want to go on the public easements that they buy car insurance. Well, maybe another judge has yeah. a question. <laughs> 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 Kind of a general question, and anyone can address it, but I think the answer will definitely help us make a little bit more of an educated decision. Um, I think in this case, we're seeing a lot of conflict between constitutional amendments, um, you know, regarding the Tenth Amendment of states' rights, and then the Commerce Clause of the First Amendment, and then the whole Necessary and Proper Clause. So, I and mean, what do we do, and what does the court do when these amendments are kind of in conflict with each other? And is it possible for one to trump another, and where do we go from here? Hey, that's your time. <laughs> <laughs> that's the opposite. So this side is glad to help you do that. <laughs> but seriously, I think you raised exactly all of the framework of how much this is being tested. There are some parts of the Constitution that do come into play in making this decision, all of the ones you designated. I think we debated a bit about the state and the individual which you bring up through the Tenth Amendment. 
I think some of the issues that would have come by the first and the fifth were dealt with a bit in the exemptions. I think that had those exemptions, had those factual findings around religious exemptions and around financial hardship not been made, I think we would have seen a much more serious challenge around the first, the first and the fifth. Um, so I don't think it's a question about whether, I, unfortunately, in, in the hierarchy, the Constitution is the highest source of law, the amendments don't take hierarchy within that document, and as it has to pass constitutional muster on each of the ones in which you've raised, and that's what we're trying to do here. So look at each one on the interstate commerce. I think it's been clear that this is, in fact, an interstate commerce issue. I'm not sure in today's economy anything could not be entrusting that is a, a, a vestige of the past. In terms of first and fifth, it's been dealt with the exemptions. And in terms of the Tenth Amendment, the states, I would argue it's the same thing as the individual who has actually got a choice of states as well as the choice of the individual. Well, the arguments around the Tenth Amendment are that we haven't raised hardly any of those. I, I would like to encourage the court to consider some other, when it comes to point how to decide this, this issue, I think there's a couple of things the court needs to consider. Uh, one, we're talking here about a piece of federal legislation uh, that, that Congress uh, says uh, it can enact under the Commerce Clause. Okay, so we're, we're having a, we have a conflict between uh, branches of government. Both, uh, by the way, the courts and the Congress have a legitimate constitutional role. The Constitution gives both of them the ability to make judgments about the constitutionality of things. And in this case, the Congress has carefully considered whether or not what it's doing is constitutional and said it is constitutional as it is under the Congress Clause, as Congress has done since the 1930s, the Supreme Court has recognized Congress's ability to make those judgments in its legislation. Uh, so like there's an issue of what's called stare decisis here. That is, does the court want to go so far as to, in this case, to overturn the Congress's judgment about what the Commerce Clause means, okay? Uh, that would be a very big step for a court that a step that we would call activist, overturning legislation uh, that the Congress deems is constitutional. Okay? It might be necessary, but you probably would think about that. Just to piggyback, because I think that's an important point that's very decisive, because you know, translates literally for to let the decision stand. And basically, what the courts will do when they raise just the issue you've done, which is to analyze these against past precedent. Stare decisis is the process of taking past precedent, past pre-existing legal standards, and bringing them forward to the current situation to stand before you. We have debated those types of cases back and forth. I think it's pretty clear that the courts have felt that this is not been a situation where it's not economic activity. Here, we fully define it. It is economic activity, and that's where the precedent should assist us in getting to that position. I'm just oh. adding that Professor Hudson's argument that we need to decide the case in his favor. <laughs> well, and, and, and I would remind the court that all the, going all the way back to John Marshall, uh, while the Congress and individual citizens can indeed interpret the Constitution, it has been up to the courts to decide what the law requires, and it is up to you to determine whether, indeed, this is an unprecedented uh, instance of federal power and federal take, uh, federal power. So you do have the authority. I uh, have the authority, however, that historically the courts have given more deference to the people than when the express power of the Constitution has rational. I just have some clarification. So what is the penalty if an individual does not pay the tax and cannot go to jail? So what is the penalty for that individual? Uh, no, I wouldn't concede that point. You can't go to jail. Uh, the, they, the, 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 the legislation right you, you mean if you can't pay the tax and if you, you can't not, afford it? If you refuse to pay the tax. If you refuse to pay the tax? <laughs> Uh, if you, you refuse to pay the tax, and you, uh, then, you as I understand it, you might get out. Actually, I think the legislation provides no penalty for refusing to pay the tax. Well, wouldn't you then get in trouble with the IRS? Yeah. Well, how many people don't pay the tax? We're going to jail. But, I mean, <laughs> well, wouldn't you? But you what you think about it, but I think that there's two things here at the beginning. Well, it's not a tax. How the people interpret them, by the way? They just want to jail for not paying them. But it's a difference between whether you apply one of the exemptions for financial hardship 
or if in fact you apply a law and not pay the tax. Those are very distinguished facts. If you can qualify. Oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Well, oh, I, I know the answer. I'm sorry. It took me a minute. No, if no one would go to jail, uh, they, they would probably attach their wages or their assets, which is which is the way most most violations of tax law are dealt with. But I would remind you, Very few people I would go remind to jail. the court that a couple, a husband and wife in Timberton, Rhode Island, are in jail this week when they won last because they did not pay their federal income taxes for 37 years. But I, 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 the maximum. The maximum penalty here is that if the maximum tax here would be two thousand dollars or so, okay, which could be recouped under the one million dollars by tax Other questions about the seventy
likely not paying the full cost of your care. This act but this law could have, you know, the law could have exempted people who, you know, if you really had a choice, it would be a choice between purchasing health care and, you know, not, you know, not using free services of the, you know, of the emergency rooms or something like that. And that's the economic problem. Right? And that could be regulated, I would imagine. Yes. So you would be on more solid ground. Congress would be able to regulate it for the interstate commerce policy on a rational basis like they've done given the choice. But they didn't do this here. <laughs> they didn't act rationally. They should have taxed everyone. I know that you should have. They could have taxed everyone. And then no question. Are the judges ready to rule or do you have to rule? Okay. So while they go out and discuss and deliberate, uh, what do you people think? Yeah, what do you all think? Yeah. Well, I was thinking about both like corporations are people too. And um, you know, they're forced to to purchase you know, equipment that will reduce emissions and comply with federal. You now that's clearly interstate commerce. Um, and also, I'm not sure if like car, like car seats, child car seats, is a federal or a state thing. Um, but that's state, the state level thing. I'm thinking about. Okay. So states can manage. Um, so yeah, I was thinking about things like that. I don't know that maybe the corporations are people too argument. No, and I don't think. I have to ask our lawyer. What about that? I, I think what, what you point out is exactly the difference between something that's economic activity that can be done in a local level and what is economic activity that cannot be done in a local level. He asking individuals to have car seats and it can be done without the complexities of what you have to do to revamp okay. what we call the healthcare system. So that is what requires a bed for the But requiring, that's a good example, requiring corporations to have certain equipment for safety. Express power, interstate commerce, ensuring the legislation on a rational basis. This is mandating it. But corporations are being regulatory. See, it, it, it goes to the point that you can use taxation to be clear for regulatory purposes. So I've got a question for the defense. Uh, are you willing to say that if it happens to be in the interest as so, as so determined by Congress in the future, that all Americans who purchase a car have to purchase a hydrogen car from General Motors. Is that a power that Congress can have? Only if the Congress can make a case that meets the rational basis test. You would immediately get into the issue again of having the choice to have a car or not, which is the plot that is missing in this discussion with Congress. Okay, sure. What if Congress forces me to buy a car? Would that be unconstitutional? Congress thinks it's a good idea so I can get places better. That's clearly rational. I ought to have a car. Congress makes sure I have it. I would argue that those facts, which are very distinguishable from these facts, would not be a rational basis test. And that's why the findings around this is different and does make a rational basis. I'm still at a loss as to how. And if you can convince me how it's different, I will give up being a libertarian and come join the Democratic Party. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an outcome. Um, <laughs> well, well, let's say it was a matter of national security. That is, um, there was a national security threat uh, that could only be uh, deterred if, in fact, every individual had available an automobile in order to, I don't know, drive to the front or uh, escape from uh, the invaders or, or whatever. In that case, you could make a rational basis. If I were closer, I would take out my letter and burn down this drum you know <laughs> I, I do think there's a factual distinction here, and that is exactly the kind of congressional hearing is that. Because you can exist without a car. Well, well, what, what about, I mean, would you concede then that the Congress could force, that could, could mandate that everybody buy war bonds at a time of war? In fact, there's been cases that have demonstrated that it's been not the case. Uh, right. Congress can mandate that I put my wife on the line in the front line. But that falls clearly under the power, uh, under the national security powers right. of the Constitution. Right. As this is where it falls under the interstate commerce, which also makes sense. Right. But it has to be put in an automobile. You have to purchase an automobile but have the program. I mean, that's a national thing. I'm not sure what you're but, you know, but manufacturers have to produce yeah. automobiles that meet those things. And by, and by extension, I guess we have to purchase Right, but I don't have the right to buy a car without it. I can't buy a car. I, I'm not allowed to buy a car that uses leaded gasoline. 
that's not something that could be less interesting because then it would be with an act like you Sure you can. No, there are cars that are out there that are, that are prior to it. You can buy those and add light to the drive around, no problem. But it has to be older than the street. It has to be about 12 bucks or daylight, right? It's dealt with it. Yeah, so I can't. I can't yeah. go and contact with somebody that's to build a new car that burns lead gasoline and buy it from that person. I'm prohibited by the law. It's another interesting issue that can't be addressed. But you're not forced to buy it either. That's right. I don't kick you out. Well, I'm forced to buy the unleaded car. It's a choice. Or if you don't have to buy a car. Yeah. Exactly. So what, what if, like, you know, like, I know you're saying, like, you force people if it's an issue of national security, which is obviously, like, a real. Um, like extreme, but you know, what if down the line Congress just decides it's economically better and therefore better for everybody if everyone just gets solar panels, like, you know, everyone gets electric cars and, like, not use gas and all that stuff, like, that's kind of like, you're saying that this is rational, like, couldn't that also kind of be like a, like, oh, it's rational that everyone, you know, stop polluting and be green and, like, it's kind of... Can I respond to that in a political way, not a legal way? Sure. No Congress is ever going to get elected that does that. Okay, and this is kind of a response to my libertarian friend. You can, you can, you can, you can create, you know, these sort of horrible scenarios about the horrible things that the government is going to do to you. Okay, but keep in mind that you have a political democracy here. But like, which you have, which you have a have a, a government that is responsible to the people. And the people have recourse. Yeah, they you, know, you, don't just, you just don't just need the Supreme Court to control the Congress. In fact, the Supreme Court is a second or, order control of the Congress. The first control is we the people. And if we the people, you know, are afraid of being required to put on solar panels, then don't vote those people at all. Right, but like if you vote those people, you might not necessarily know that they're like, you know, they're going to try and promote stuff, you know, promote green stuff. And like she said before, we use all the, um, like, you know, we use well, cases from the past to, to, to do the future. So <coughs> if this gets passed, then we can say, oh, look, when we pass this, you know, why can't, yeah. Excuse me, apropos this legislation, if people don't like the idea of an individual mandate, they don't need to go to court and get the Supreme Court to overturn it on purported constitutional grounds. You can simply vote in the Republican Party that has said quite clearly it wants to repeal the subject. So elect them and get them to repeal it. You can do it democratically. You don't need to overturn it. And just quickly from a legal standpoint, I'm not sure you could build a case of rational support behind that because you don't have the same political
for us that changed the argument and that is what we felt that things included in the individual mandate which would help regulate insurance and things like this even in the screening for real reasons. And also since it is a national crisis, the Very 
much in terms of the facts that are presented in the court, in terms of the particular cases right now, they're very procedural in nature. Much of that is procedural because the issue really isn't right. This issue right. really isn't going to be right until 2015, 2016. Right. There really isn't a plaintiff that could really bring this case to court. And, and it's very likely that the court should need could. an individual plaintiff. So they should have won. That that will be an issue. So they may rule on something yeah. very narrow uh, that may not be instructive to the issue you're getting at. Right. Although if I had to argue the other side of the equation, I think Medicare and Medicaid may be differentiated on the fact that there's a government sponsored program versus right. third party. Right. Yeah. Just stepping off of that, this is more curiosity, but you talked before about different um, judicial precedents that have been set in the interesting terms. Has the court ever considered Medicaid or Medicare in light of the interstate commerce, and what was the ruling on that? Yes, they have. They've actually done it multiple times. And, and again, they've come in on very narrow facts. I mean, that's, that's the problem with stare decisis and why you have to marry so many precedents, because the courts are coming in very narrowly, and they have to put the pieces, almost like the pieces of a puzzle together to see the picture. I think when you look at the body of law around Medicare and Medicaid, it has been firmly rooted in the Constitution. Although it does have the factual distinction of being a government report. I, I think a more general point, in the sense of Professor Hart's been talking about political problems, um, for some groups in society, especially on the right, law, uh, lawsuits are simply just one political uh, arrow out of a whole bunch of arrows that you might have to attack social programs. So, I mean, <coughs> there have been attempts to starve social programs by, you know, shutting down the government and so on. Some people argue that uh, George W. Bush deliberately spent a lot of money to try to run the deficit up so high that you couldn't fund social programs. So I think you know you're you're correct in that there are people who may go after Medicare, uh, but it won't necessarily be only by the courts; it will be by the Um. Well, I have a question that I hope is going to go along with what we're talking about, but. But my question is uh, the tax that you would put on people that don't pay it. Um, what's the guarantee that that tax money is going to go to the medical or to the health care plan? Because as you just spoke of, that we have a, I think it's a three trillion dollar deficit at this point. Um, might be higher. But what's the guarantee that you're not going to use this money for? something else that, again, in 2015, I mean, hopefully it won't happen, but how do we know another September 11th isn't going to happen? Right. And all of a sudden, all these taxes that people are paying don't cover medical care anymore. Is there any type of way to guarantee that you actually do pay for medical care? I think if you, if you look at the law, I think there's, a, there's actually a progressive finding that indicates this is where the revenue stream from these, they also appropriate once they tax, and so they have appropriated this towards going to the healthcare system to defray the cost otherwise if, if they weren't doing it. Because because that's really the only one way in which it's going to help deal with it. I mean, with this minimum coverage, it's estimated that the federal government's going to save $100 billion in the debt, and we're going to $32 million by 2019 dealt with because of this minimum coverage. So it's, it's also those who are going to abide by the law and purchase the coverage and you're going to have a wider pool of individuals who are both healthy and demanding on the system that will help bring the rates down and help support the system. And then really the tax funds are going to start. And I think you know, Professor Hens probably can speak to this a lot better than I can, but I think the, the, the hope is that this will bring health care costs overall down and that will make it possible as well to more easily ensure. Yeah, and actually uh, the Congress didn't directly address and a lot of critics of this legislation say that Congress ducked the serious health care cost issue in, in, because the health care costs have a lot to do with how people are utilizing the health care system, how we use technology, how we pay doctors and hospitals, etc. Uh, and uh, this legislation doesn't really address that uh, in a big way. Well, there, although there are some mechanisms in here, and I think a lot of policy analysts are assuming that if this legislation would in fact take effect, uh, the federal government would then have even more leverage, leverage a lot of leverage it already has to be Medicare program, and more leverage to then start uh, imposing regulations on providers 
in such a way as to keep health care debt costs down, uh, which is done in most other uh, industrial markets. But that's a whole other really large um, I know that certain plans you have to pay like five thousand dollars or a certain amount before you get your drugs for a lower cost. With this legislation, would that change so that you wouldn't have to pay that large sum up front? Because I know that affects a lot of people, and then they pay that money up front, but nobody has five thousand dollars out of pocket just to give. So would this plan change that and make it so you don't have to pay all that money up front? Well, the plan is supposed to make health insurance more accessible. Okay, so that so that involves several things. One, uh, there's sets of subsidies for individuals who don't who can't afford health care. They, they, their costs will be subsidized. Okay. Also, the existence exchanges is supposed to create competition among health plans. Uh, and there are also some regulations as to the. The choices that health insurance companies can offer, okay, so that so that they, they call it bronze, silver, gold. So different cost plans uh, that people can choose from when there's supposed to be competition. And the hope is that in fact uh, there will be more choices and people will be put in a position where they can't get insurance because they have you know, we have front of Or that the exchanges will create situations where you may have different policies from which to purchase and and make that choice between uh, pharmaceuticals and primary care or whatever. Uh, but it really depends on how how robust these exchanges are. Um, and, and just to that point, I mean, it's not like we have a free market system in healthcare now, and this is somehow leading to uh, less competition. It's really, what we have in the United States are state by state monopolies or duopolies, where you know there are only really two major carriers. Rhode Island is Blue Cross and United Health, and now Tufts, I guess. But essentially, right now, competition is very, very limited. You don't have a great deal of choice. So ideally, this is going to actually expand the choice that people have so that they can uh, purchase a plan that has better drug coverage. And back to the individual mandate. The reason for the individual mandate, if you remember the original slide, was to prevent free riders from, from those people who are going to get health care more pain. So, you know, it, it's an attempt to have the to have the market solve the problem in effect in terms of cost controls. Um, but you need this caveat of an individual mandate in order to make sure people don't ride on the on the back of others. Um, okay, the tax. So either way, they're going to end up in jail. So when you just cut the middleman and make them pay. Excuse me. Nobody's going to jail. Okay, well, if they don't pay their taxes, the IRS is going to And then if they don't pay, no? I'm just a lawyer who's in jail. Exactly, exactly. I'm trying to get their wages. Yeah, they go through the attaching of the wages as much for the civil tax as they get criminal penalties. Okay, so what they're going to do is they're going to have to pay their taxes. Okay, so they're going to have to pay their taxes. Okay, so they're going to have to pay their taxes. Okay, so they're going to have to pay their taxes. Okay, so they're going to have to pay their taxes. Okay, so they're going to have to pay their taxes. That would have been an alternate method that I suppose Congress could have debated. I mean, I, I, I wish you see if I was debated a lot right now. Well, that's exactly. Right. 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 And I think that they felt that this was the, the most equitable way in which to deal with something that's a flaw in the current system and what potentially could be wrong. Or it's more universal way because as it works right now, if you go to an emergency room and you get billed, you can. Say I don't have any money, and the hospital or the provider will, yeah, you know, grant you economic hardship oh, and, and waive your expenses or work with you. So, or you go bankrupt. Or you go bankrupt. I mean, that's that's typically what happens. You build up big medical bills, you go bankrupt. So, in the first place, why do you why do you get medical treatment? Because you don't have the coverage. Well, now I use it. Because of the crowd right, right, right. 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 doctors, can't, the doctors can't, deny, can't deny treatment. A bleeding person is lying on the floor. Isn't that what the doctors kind of get? Like, I mean, for a lot of people, I've turned to the roof. Like, <laughs> really, because they, like, they end up giving, they can't refuse health care to people, but what's the incentive to pay for your health care? There's absolutely none. If the doctor has to give it to you, 
so he just doesn't get paid for all the time that he just put in and all of his, you know. The incentive is still right. like not making any money. Yeah. We can. The government gets paid. Not necessarily, though. Yeah, but it's you're not. But that's why you're in the same place. That's why you're in the same place. Hospitals build this into their budget. Hospitals, hospitals assume that they're going to have that there's a certain number of their patients and they're not going to have health insurance. Yeah, but if you and don't they, work for the hospital, but you still have to like see a patient in the emergency room. Let me think. They, they, they build into their budgets the assumption that a lot of people they treat are, are not going to have health insurance. <coughs> they're not going to need money for those patients, and therefore they charge those people who do have health insurance more. You see? So the hospital is going to get its money somehow. Right, the hospital is going to get its money, money, but maybe not the doctor, like the individual doctor who has to... Doctors do the same thing. Doctors do the same thing. And the insurance companies do the same thing. So in essence, those who are paying are paying for those who are the free riders. So that's one of the major reasons health costs in the United States are so high. Because people with insurance are paying for those without. Sometimes they don't want to pay for health insurance premiums. Sometimes they don't want to pay for doctor's fees. Sometimes they don't want to pay for taxes. Medicaid and so on. But I mean that and that's one of the reasons for healthcare reform. It's precisely that. I just want to point out that doctors have had negotiated salaries for quite some time because of Medicare and Medicaid. I think the I'm not sure of the actual percentage, but it's something like they can only collect like thirty percent of the Medicaid procedure that they perform. So and because Medicaid and Medicare is such a large part of the healthcare system, um, since these programs have been in place, doctors have but it is made up by this impact. And this jury built system obviously is not working. I mean, that's why hospitals are all in big trouble financially. Doctors are complaining and you know that they're not getting compensated adequately. I mean, it, I mean, I think everybody agrees that the existing system, you know, is, is well heading as first of all would say, heading towards a cliff. You know, and uh, this healthcare legislation is supposed to be the tip to prevent it from going over, um, you know, but we'll see. It's a spiral, because the national economy gets worse, and you see more national economy It's going to continue to be a lot of national Oh, yeah, I mean, the, the fact, I mean, I think it's really telling that in this recession, suddenly there's five million more than before. It's happening people lose their jobs and their insurance, okay? And also, and also employers, are increasingly finding it difficult to afford insurance. So in the future, employers will not be able to, they're already trying to impose more of the cost of their insurance on their employees in order to escape high premium costs. And more and more of them are simply going to drop insurance. You know, employer-based health insurance is completely voluntary. No business is required to offer that benefit to its employees. What about like small oh, businesses? Yeah. What they what small businesses are? I know you said up to fifteen employees, but what about people on the cusp? Because like the the big corporations probably won't wouldn't hurt that much. But for the people who are like kind of a little bit more on the edge of like trying to make ends meet, wouldn't that hurt them? Well, what happens to a small business? This is a situation in Rhode Island. What happened a few years ago was that Rhode Island is one of the more generous states in terms of Medicaid. They have a program called Right Care, and the problem was as Right Care offered better and better benefits. There were small businesses in the state who were saying, I don't have to provide health insurance for my employees anymore, I'm going to write care. And so, and so the, the, the number of people who were, who were getting their health insurance through the government, the government paid you know, for Medicaid, was growing, but these were people who were employed full time. So, you know, if, if the costs are shift away from the small business, if that's what you're concerned about, somebody's going to pick them up. It's going to be the taxpayer or somebody else. That's one of the difficulties. Somebody's going to pay the cost. And if one group isn't, then another group is. If it isn't the private, it's going to be the public, and so on. And one of the reasons this is so messy, just as, which I think is messy, is because it's out of the political process. And this went through the U.S. Congress, where you know there are Democrats, there are Republicans, there are conservatives, there are liberals, and that's that's the kind of stuff that comes out of the democratic process. It's a messy kind of thing like this. We're at 8.30 and probably, uh, I think we can, we'll stick around and um, have conversations with you if you want to go. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but remember if you're here for a class,